Good afternoon and welcome. The spring presidential address provides us with an opportunity to gather for a report on the progress of the university. Thank you for joining me for what I hope will be an informative and an enlightening look into the opportunities and the challenges facing you all many. First, I would like to acknowledge the faculty and staff and students here with us today, as well as members of the University Council, the University of Albany Foundation, and the Alumni Association. I would also like to recognize Provost Jim Steller, members of the Executive Committee and Council of Deans. These are the leaders that assist me in shaping a compelling vision for the future of the university and play an integral role in engaging all of you to help us carry out our mission. I am proud to stand before you as the 19th president of the University at Albany. As you will recall, during my inaugural address, I identified four areas that will advance the university to the next level of excellence. These include expanding degree granting programs, recruiting more outstate and international students, enhancing community engagement culture, and growing our resources to fulfill our mission. Over the past year, we have focused on advancing these areas in a number of ways. For example, we have continued to grow the research portfolio, including the UAlbany-led Advanced Statewide Weather Observation System, or MESANET, the pursuit of big data analytics as a academic strategy to help us finance our mission, and the advancement of the immense potential of the RNA Institute as a strategy for discovering new solutions in human health. We have not wavered in our commitment to public engagement. Our partnership as the host institution for the Albany Promise is a tangible example of this commitment. And just recently, we launched a data collection system to capture the, and communicate our efforts to apply basic research to solutions to complex societal issues. We have witnessed a 55% increase in the number of international students in recent years and have implemented an aggressive plan to nearly double this enrollment over the next five years. At the same time, we have furthered our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Through U Access, we are able to offer distinctive programming that draws our diverse campus community together. I would also be remiss if I did not cite athletics as an example of our excellence. We have experienced an incredible year for our athletic program. The program has garnered numerous NCAA tournament bids and accolades, coupled with a high graduation rate for our student athletes. The athletic program's success is an institutional asset that contributes to our institutional reputation, it deepens alumni pride, promotes philanthropy, and attracts perspective, prospective students. In addition, we have made progress in growing and managing our financial resources. For example, I'm pleased at our progress in developing a strategic legislative agenda at both the state and the federal levels. This will secure funds to advance our academic vision and build a coalition of awareness and support in the political arenas which I believe is absolutely necessary in the state of New York. Just this week, our efforts secured $250,000 in seed funding to establish a NYSAR Center for Excellence in Atmospheric and Environmental Prediction and Innovation. This designation will help us leverage federal funding sources. As you know, we launched a new compact planning and budgeting process intended to improve the transparency and the strategic nature of our financial decision making. And in development, we are cultivating growth and giving across the board. We're extremely honored to receive a $5.25 million gift, the largest gift ever made to you Albany, from the Masary family to support the School of Business, another university-wide initiative. While these examples indicate our university is forging a new path, we must also address some serious financial and reputational challenges. 
we have come face to face with the cumulative effect of insufficient investments over the past decades. Insufficient investment in people, in discovery, in our physical plan, and in high need academic programs. We need more competitive scholarship awards and support packages to attract the top students at all levels. We're also losing ground in competitive salaries and experiencing increased compression in our compensation structure. We must continue to invest in research infrastructure that will sustain discovery, scholarship, and increase faculty productivity. As previously announced, initial efforts to address these issues include a blue ribbon panel, which has been charged to develop a series of recommendations to enhance the professional experience of our part-time and contingent faculty colleagues. I have also established a presidential initiative fund for research and scholarship aimed at providing seed funds for multidisciplinary research. However, our most significant financial threat is declining enrollment. Over the past eight years, the total annual enrollment of this university has decreased by more than 1,000 students. Continued failure to hit these targets will have real financial consequences particularly as Chancellor Ziffer calls for a system-wide growth. So we must strive to reverse this trend to ensure adequate funding to advance our mission. We must also work to improve the perception of our academic excellence. Despite our world-class research and scholarship, successful alum, and some of the most diverse and engaged students in the SUNY system, we need to do more to advance our institutional reputation. I expect our new Vice President for Communication and Marketing will spearhead the development of an institutional communication strategy which will require all of us to embrace the institutional brand. Though we have challenges, I am personally energized by the possibilities. As much as I believe this is a great university, I know we all recognize that it can and it must achieve more. At this point in our history, the university identity and our reputation is heavily influenced by two things, the scope of our academic offering and the quality of the academic experiences we offer. Today, I invite everyone to reimagine the academic profile of the university at Albany. I believe that there are three critical strategies that have the power to transform the university at Albany and advance its reputation as a truly great public research university. They are enhancing the student experience, expanding the academic profile, and developing new vision for the East Campus. The first strategy will be familiar to most of us, yet transformational nonetheless. We must be united in advancing our efforts to improve the student experience by both enhancing the undergraduate experience and strengthening graduate education. Provost Steller is working hard to counteract enrollment and retention issues with a renewed focus on the undergraduate experience. In order to improve retention, Jim has a similar working group on enhancing the student experience, which will identify additional strategies to improve educational outcomes, improve first to second year retention, reduce the time to degree, increase students' satisfaction and support for graduate successful transition from college to career. To make material progress and improve an undergraduate experience, it is necessary for the academic and the student affairs side of the house to work together seamlessly. The Provost's Office and the Office for Student Success have increased both the number of writing and critical inquiry instructors for freshmen and the number of living learning communities as well. We're also working to implement a technology assistant advising tool, such as an early warning system to identify students at the risk of dropping out of the university at Albany. In addition, we continue significant efforts to improve recruitment and increase our enrollment. Our undergraduate admission team has instituted the use of a powerful system to automate communications with prospective undergraduate students, 
The department also has extended our reach to outstate audiences by adding five domestic regional recruiters and a part-time international recruiter as well. I believe an initial focus on enhancing the undergraduate experience is a good start. But I'm also willing to acknowledge we need to do more, particularly for all of our students, but in particular for our graduate students. In order to achieve enrollment increases at the graduate level, we must become more competitive in recruiting the best and the brightest students. This will require us to increase and strengthen our program offerings at the master's degree level and offer fair and competitive levels of graduate student support. To this end, I look forward to receiving the recommendations from the Graduate Student Stipend Committee by the end of this semester. In addition to ensure we are delivering a high quality graduate education, we are examining our organizational structure for administering graduate education. As we endeavor to improve the student experience and increase the enrollment of students locally, nationally, and abroad, we must continue to invest in faculty excellence, from recruitment and retention to faculty development and provide more competitive salaries. Let us not forget that it is the faculty who will ensure that the academic excellence that will sustain and advance our institutional reputation. The second strategy relies also very heavily on faculty excellence and engagement. Together, we must expand the scope of the academic profile of this university in ways that will increase our capacity for innovation, productivity, and excellence. We have begun to expand the academic profile by providing a public option for engineering in the capital region. We are now embracing a vision, a vision for a College of Engineering and Applied Sciences to be located on this, in the Schuyler Building on the downtown campus. Our urban location allows us to be very distinctive and be a distinctive driver for economic revitalization in the city. The vision includes a makerspace with public-private partnerships, such as those through Startup New York program. New programs begins with our courses in computer engineering and will help us do better educate and retain more students to meet the demand of our local industries. The best opportunity to establish the university engineering presence, I believe, is to create niche programs that capitalize on our existing strength. And of course, such an endeavor would not be possible without the solid foundation built on the building blocks develop our, our College of Computing and Information. Our next step is to use a portion of the $4 million in capital funding to support a wider downtown revitalization initiative. As part of the design and planning for the Schuyler Innovation, we will conduct a corridor study that includes examination of the interface between the downtown campus and the adjacent city neighborhoods. We will also create a College of Emergency Preparedness and Homeland Security and Cybersecurity. I'd like to thank Governor Cuomo for the confidence that he's placed in us as the home for this very unique college. In order to stand up the foundation for this collegiate unit by the fall, Provost Steller has asked Dean Rousseau to lead the effort and has named a steering committee to help shape the academic vision and the direction for the new college. In this spirit, we will continue to work closely with our faculty experts from the School of Public Health, the School of Business, the Rockefeller College, and the College of Computing and Information, and several state agencies. The designation also came with a $15 million capital appropriation to construct a facility to house the new college but we quickly noted synergies between the need of the new college and our plans for our Emerging Technology and Entrepreneurship Com Complex, or ETEC for short. Therefore, we have requested an amendment to change the site location of the ETEC building to include the new college to be built on a 12-acre tract on the Harriman campus. Chancellor Zimfer is supportive of this request to modify our Campus 2020 plan and we are now awaiting approval from the governor's office. 
This will, of course, delay the opening of the E-Tech building by approximately 18 months, but the long-term gains, we believe, are clearly worth it. We will also expand the academic profile by deepening our institution affiliation with the Albany Law School. As you know, we began engaging in discussions regarding this particular affiliation over 12 months ago. The affiliation with Albany Law will provide a multitude of new opportunities in program renewal and innovative inquiry that would significantly benefit both institutions and the region as well. Our faculties are already working to design new interdisciplinary degree programs that neither could offer alone. Together, I believe we can redefine how legal education will be delivered in the future. Finally, we're advancing a strategy to develop a new vision for the East Campus. The East Campus is the home to academic excellence in the School of Public Health, the Cancer Research Center, and corporate tenants like Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Nonetheless, many of us share in the anticipation of a more vibrant, synergistic future for the East Campus. A strategic vision for this campus is emerging as the University at Albany's Health Sciences Research Campus. This vision opens several paths for expanding the scope of this university. We will explore the possibilities of a deeper academic research affiliation with Downstate Medical Center, the Albany Medical College, and the New York State Department of Health, as well as other public and private agencies and institutions. Programs such as Startup New York and the Governor's Broadband Expansion Plan will be utilized to establish new collaborative partnerships that spur additional academic innovation, specifically in biotech and in the health sciences field. By summer, I will charge a working group to explore the opportunities inherited in this vision and produce a recommendation to share with the campus community. Today, I have shared with you our ambitious vision to expand the University of Albany and to a much more comprehensive public research university than ever before. If we want to advance and distinguish our University of Albany, we must grow our enrollment by broadening our academic offering and cultivate new programs. We must deliver graduates who meet the demand of today's global economy and help them cultivate the critical skills necessary to successfully reinvent themselves throughout their lives. We must continue to invest in our research infrastructure and embrace public engagement as an outreach vehicle for translating the knowledge and expertise of the campus into the community. We must position the university as an integral partner in economic development and community improvement. We must remember that great comprehensive universities maintain a strong and vibrant core in the liberal arts and humanities that inform interdisciplinary inquiry and prepare its students to become global citizens. And finally, if we want to advance and distinguish the University of Albany, we must tell our story in ways that enhance our institutional reputation and garner the additional students and additional resources needed for a vibrant future. I know we have a lot of hard work ahead of us. There will be choices and there will be trade-offs. This is precisely why I invite you to join me in building our university at Albany for the future. Since our founding as a normal school, the university has fostered innovation through visionary endeavors such as the School of Public Health, the Rockefeller College, and the College of Nanoscale Science and Engineering, among others. Once again, we are reimagining our university from the inside out. And we are the generation of stewards who will expand the university's academic foot footprint and provide truly transformational learning experiences to our students. I know I can count on you to be fully engaged in our efforts to help the University of Albany fulfill its destiny as a comprehensive research university and elevate us to a higher level of excellence. I thank you for being here today. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, could you wait for the uh, microphone so everyone can hear the question? Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Sir, there's something I think you've left out today to a degree. <laughs> Not hard to do. Um, like all previous presidents of this university, uh, who have been not willing to uh, uh, make an overt campaign, an overt campaign to build faculty excellence. That's something that I don't think you gave enough attention to here today either. Um, but I'm hoping you'll be our man. And one reason is, and you've mentioned this some today, that uh, faculty quality will either undergird or undermine almost everything you've been talking about, your four stakes and the other stuff today. It's terribly important, it's terribly fundamental, more so than any of the individual items that you mention. So, uh, I'm hoping that you'll be stepping up to the plate here and doing something overt from the top. Of course, Stellar and deans will have to uh, do their parts too, and chairs and everyone, but it needs to be uh, bearing your stamp of approval and insistence. Uh, one last thing is this, improving faculty quality can't but help us climb out of the cellar that we're in, in, for example, the US News ranking of best national universities, where we're sitting at, well, we're outside 100 even. We're, we don't even crack yep. the 100. Yep. I think we're around 126th. We've got to get out of that kind of position. The other university centers have done better, although not terribly much better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Can, uh, can you state your name and your affiliation? Yeah. Uh, when you ask a question, if you could start by stating your name and your... Oh, sorry, I should have thought of that. <laughs> Win means, yes. I came here I early on, <laughs> uh, 1965, sure. when we were just getting started. I retired in 1998 <clears throat> yeah. from the geology group. Well, Wynn, thank you very much for the question. And this is, Wynn was one of the first people to write to me when I got this job and raised the issue that he continues to raise. So thank you for keeping me uh, on task about this win. I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, we tried to highlight that a bit in the comments, that everything that we talked about in terms of advancing uh, and having more focus on undergraduate education, expanding the academic scope of this university, as I said in the remarks, we can't get that done without a fo focus on faculty excellence. And I have told people in several meetings, you know, I've been meeting with all 39 departments in the two schools that are not structured around uh, 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 departmental lines, that we really do have to start to be more aggressive about how, who we recruit, who we, were hire, who we hire, and who we promote at this university. We have slipped a bit, I think, over time, and you have written to me and complained about this, and I'm, as I'm sure you, you wrote to other presidents and complained about it, but I can assure you, we are taking this very seriously. Jim Steller and I have had conversations about this, and I know he's engaging the deans as well. There's no way that this university can be great and educate the students that will go on to do wonderful things in their lives without greater attention and focus on the quality of our faculty. We must hire good people. We must provide them with the support to do what they do to advance the academic reputation of this university across the board. I get it, and it is a core part of what we're trying to do, and that's why we tried to suggest in our comments that that is an undergirding strategy, and I couldn't agree with you more. There's another question here.
Hi, I'm Joanne Kaufman. I'm in the Department of Sociology. I have a question related to undergraduate education. I'm in a department that teaches a very large number of students, both our majors, our minors, and the service we do for a large number of majors and minors at this university. My concern is we teach very large classes. We're being encouraged to take on more students. How are we going to deliver a high quality undergraduate education experience in very large classes with very few graduate students? Well, I think you've raised a very valid concern, and that's one of the reasons we know we have to do a better job of creating and adding particularly additional master's degree program. Because when you look at one of the areas where it's very, very clear to me and clear to folks on my leadership team, and I think most of the deans and the faculty that I've had discussions about this would agree that we have an insufficient number of master's degree programs in particular. And so we do need to think about how we advance additional master's degree programs. And as we think about, it's going to take time, as we think about expanding the academic profile, we're not just talking about growing more undergraduate courses in engineering. We're talking about undergraduate courses leading to new master's degree programs and new PhD programs. So in the vision that we've articulated, part of what's implicit in that vision is that as these new academic programs expand, we will be bringing in a type of graduate student that we really don't have today because we don't offer those programs. But at the same time, I am very much aware that we need to do more to recruit the best and the brightest graduate students into the programs that we have. And we have to provide more uh, competitive stipends in order to drive that agenda because I am very concerned and disturbed when I know we lose good students because unfortunately graduate students sometimes decide on where to enroll based on the difference between a few thousand dollars not based on the quality of the academic program or the professors they're going to be studying on it. That's the decision I made. It was more about who was going to be my advisor than whether or not one place was paying three thousand dollars a year versus $4,000 a year. That tells you how long ago I was in graduate school. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. <clears throat> I don't know. I don't know if you guys want to meet him or not. <laughs> the question was, will I introduce Dr. Steller? I, I really should have uh, provided an opportunity for him to stand on the front end, but I didn't want him to mess up the floor of my comments. So. Jim, would you please stand and be recognized? <laughs> and let me just say, uh, one of the comments that we had to edit out of this uh, rather long speech, and hopefully it wasn't too long, you didn't get too bored, was that Jim is really uh, proven, in the short time he's been here, he's been here roughly about two months, to tomorrow I think. Tomorrow. Tomorrow will be two months. And Jim has really hit the ground running, I think, and I think most of my colleagues would agree. I um, mean, he made more decisions in the first week he was provost, and I made it my first month as president. And so he really has embraced and taking responsibility for advancing the academic mission. And another thing I'd just like to touch on, too, that I kind of said in passing, but I'm really, really pleased with the way that Jim and Mike Christakis, the leaders of our academic side of the house and the student success of the student affairs side of the house. I've been around this work long enough to know that you can't advance a more strategic focus on the graduate or under particularly the undergraduate experiences without these two sides of the house working seamlessly together. And in the very short time that both of these gentlemen have been in their role, we have seen a renewal of synergistic relationships, thinking about how they need to work seamlessly to really create the kind of environment that I think that we once had at this university, but we lost over time. And you've heard me say several times, I constantly run into people that graduated from this university decades ago, who remind me that this was the university that was the top of the mind of almost every household that had students that were graduating and thinking about going to, to university. University at Albany was at the top of the mind of almost every household in the state of New York. 
part of the reason that we're being very specific and very laser focused on enhancing particularly the undergraduate experience because that's one of the areas where I think we have some wonderful programs but it's very clear to me and my colleagues it's an area where we need to do more. We need to make sure that students graduate from this university with such an amazing experience they will go out and tell others because at the end of the day our graduates are the best recruiters for this university. And so we really are very excited about what we need to do in order to strengthen the undergraduate experience to make sure that students are, uh, are being retained to second year, that they are graduating in four years, and that we're providing the resources to help them do that, that we're helping with retention by augmenting our advising system with data-driven strategies that not only tells us whether or not a student is on at risk of dropping out of the university, but would tell us almost instantaneously over time whether or not the student is on track to graduate in a timely fashion. That's the kind of innovation that other institutions like Georgia State and Arizona State have brought to the table. These are tried and true strategies that we know will potentially have an impact on the quality of the undergraduate experience at this university and that's why we're very excited about that as being one of the overarching frameworks for the work that we need to do to move this university to the next level of excellence. Yes. Well, it, it plays a very, did everyone hear the question? Oh, good, because I'm not sure if I could repeat it completely, but I do understand it. Um, I don't think, and Jim, uh, maybe you or Sue can help me if I'm wrong about this, I don't think we slipped to a 30 to 1 ratio. Uh, we would be in real trouble if that were the case. I think it's still slightly around 20 to 1, maybe somewhere in that neighborhood. Jim has already articulated a strategy to, to reduce that. Because that's one of the reasons we have trouble with rankings and some of the other challenges. Our faculty-student ratio is critically important, and frankly, uh, it was part of the strategic plan that Sue Phillips had laid out when she was the provost of this university. And we've made some incremental progress in that regard, but as a part of this focus on the undergraduate experience, that's one of the things that I know we need to be much more attentive to we really do have to think about how we grow the faculty at this university uh, and to do a better job of addressing instruction in very large classes and et cetera. So uh, we haven't gotten that bad, Nancy, but uh, there's still room for growth in that area and that's gonna help tremendously uh, with some of the other things we're trying to do uh, here at the University at Albany. Um, is there another question? We'll take one more if there is one. President Jones, I'm Danielle Leonard from the Office of International Education, and I appreciate the articulation of your vision of improving academic excellence and student support services to attract out-of-state and international students, but I was wondering if you could speak more broadly to your goals for comprehensive internationalization. Sure. Well, I think most of you have heard me uh, talk about this, and I think it becomes critically important at this juncture when we're on the cusp of hiring a new vice provost for internationalization or international programs. Uh, we're not sure exactly. I know what it's called now, but we're thinking about uh, maybe renaming that office because in addition to what we do extremely well, uh, in terms of student mobility, the number of study abroad sites that we offered. I think you've heard me say this. As we think about uh, bringing in more international students uh, to help drive our enrollment agenda, which we absolutely have to do, 
because as I've said several times, you only have to look at the uh, profile of the number of four-year-olds that exist in the state of New York today versus what's going to exist a decade from now, and it tells you that our strategy of 90, 92% of our students coming from the state of New York is not going to be sustainable. And for a number of reasons, we have to think more broadly about where our undergraduate and our graduate students are going to come from. We will continue to have a very strong focus on recruiting students from the state of New York. I've said that time and time again. This internationalization and recruiting non-resident students does not undermine that or is, is not completely, completely out of alignment with that. And this is where I think we need to do a better job of attracting those domestic, those New York State students that just don't come here because we don't offer the programs that they want for far too many students. So it's all connected. But to get to the core of your question, so in addition to continue to recruit international students, more non-resident students, continue to uh, make sure that our students are having that well-rounded education we talked about by making sure they're taking advantage of study abroad opportunities. Uh, we do pretty good relative to other higher education institutions in terms of sending students abroad. But we also need to do better. And I have signed the university on to a commitment from the Institute for International Education that we're going to double the number of students that we send abroad uh, from the current number uh, from about 12% up to about 24%. I think that's doable. I think that's going to add tremendously to our international experience. But the other part of what I think you're asking is that in addition to student mobility and recruit, increasing uh, and recruiting more international students, we also have to expand our academic profile internationally as well. And what I mean by that, we need to be seeking out really strategic opportunities to advance international scholarship where our faculty and our staff are working and our students, our graduate and undergraduate, or working with people from around the world on scholarly projects. And we're starting to make some progress in that regard. Uh, just to use an example, our uh, Atmospheric Science Department and the Center for Atmospheric Science Research have developed a very good collaboration with the National University of Taiwan, so much so that I traveled with a key number of faculty from those units to Taiwan uh, back this past summer to help uh, foster and advance a deep research scholarly partnership. So these folks aren't just, you know, exchanging graduate students and coming to spend time in each other's lab. They're doing all of that, but they also are writing grants together. They submitted a major grant to the NSF that I, we heard a few weeks ago was approved to go to the next round. So this is an example of internationalization where we are not only dealing with student mobility, we're thinking more strategically about deep, reciprocal, international partnerships along research and scholarship with other universities from around the world. That's the vision that I have for this university, and that's the vision that's going to help raise our reputation and respect not only domestically, but internationally as well. Anyway, you've been very kind and gracious, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to have this dialogue. And uh, we will look forward to continuing to advance these initiatives and coming back in a timely fashion to keep you updated as a university community. Thank you all, and together we can, we will, we must advance this university to the next level of excellence. And again, I'm extremely proud. I'm still proud after almost two and a half years to be the 19th president of the University of Albany. Thank you very much.